Hello and welcome to the Wisden World Cup Daily Podcast. New Zealand make it four wins from four at the 2023 World Cup with a routine victory over Afghanistan. But Afghanistan will rue a number of mistakes, several drop catches, including a couple of real clangers, allow New Zealand to a total of 288, something that Afghanistan never really threatened to chase down. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today for the first time this World Cup is Cam Ponsonby. Cam, as you said, when you came into the office door towards the end of that game, what a game. What a game. Yeah, that was, I, I got really, really frustrated with Afghanistan today because I think in the the 48 or 72 hours that's unfolded since Afghanistan turned over England and there was this debate about, was this an upset? I think it looks like it was an upset <laughs> at the moment because like Afghanistan were they were borderline rubbish today. But the, the, the frustrating thing there is I've said that and I'm immediately going to contradict it in terms of 44 overs with the ball, with the ball, they were completely competent and they were in a cricket match. But their fielding just let them down so dramatically. And it really was a case of there are a couple of tough chances, there are a couple of real sitters. And the phrase I always kind of go back to is like, you can't call 50 50 chances, 50 50 chances if 100% of them are going down. Afghanistan today were just, they were nowhere. And it ended up really costing them because 288 just always looked like way too many. It always looked like too many, but sort of as you say, on another day, they could have bowled in exactly the same way they did and actually restrict New Zealand to something around 210. But they were they were really, really bad in the field. And there were some positives with the ball um, actually compared to, to the England game in that, um, for a start, they responded quite well. New Zealand took on Naby more than England yeah. did, um, yet they were uh, they were able to be adaptable. Uh, as Matullah... Uh, is not someone who's done a lot with the ball in international cricket, but he picked up two wickets in and over. He's, you know, a, a, we, we talked about Afghanistan having a good bowling attack. Yeah. He's not a name that we talk about there. Um, shall we start with your moment of the game? Because I think that really does sum up the match, really. So it was Tom Latham went on the reverse sweep. He's in the, I think it's in the final kind of 10 overs, around the 40 over mark. He gets the reverse sweep out and Majib drops an absolute sitter. But he doesn't even really get there. He kind of lifts one hand up towards the ball as if he was kind of like in goal in seven aside and kind of didn't want to save one going just above his head. And the ball just goes past him and Rashid Khan loses his mind. Majib kind of gives the signals, oh, it was wobbling. And he was like, well, I haven't seen any other international cricketers kind of put that catch down in a long time. And it made me think of, it was actually really kind of telling moment in terms of the context of the Afghanistan camp because after the, the win against England there was this video um, that the ICC put out on the, like, the World Cup um, socials and everyone was laughing and joking because I think it was Fazal Faruqi had dropped Mark Wood um, to win the match basically but it was fine it didn't matter and Jonathan Trott the coach is making a laugh and joking like oh we've always said if we take our chances and one day Fazal you'll have the chance to take the winning catch for Afghanistan and we had the chance today, but it didn't happen. And everyone's laughing. Rashid Khan jumps up and he's laughing mm. as well, being like, oh, and it was off my bowling as well, kind of like in terms of this is a happy moment, but I'm taking the piss out of the fact that you guys drop everything off my bowling. And today we had that reverse where rather than it being like the happy team environment, it was all kind of falling apart. Mm. And you could kind of see, you could see the kind of morale of the team just sapping out of them over those last, well, the last six overs, it was 78 runs. And when we talk about a match where you might res restrict someone to 210. That's a, that's a game of cricket where the, the scoring rate is four and a half or five or whatever. 78 and six overs is, is 13 runs and over. It completely changes the complex mm. complexion of the match. And there, there are a few things um, that I didn't like as well. They, Afghanistan took ages to bowl their overs for a team that's quite spin heavy. And I think they just lose a lot of their momentum and it, it may speak as well to a, a lack of clarity. There was a bit of discussion after the game against India where it sounded like um, Hash Matula and Jonathan Trott, the captain and coach, had very different ideas of how early to bring Rashid Khan yeah. into the attack. So it, they don't look like a team that has a, has a clear game plan. Um, Alfred asked on Twitter, how long will it take the teams to realise that Dew isn't a real thing in this tournament? I think this is quite an interesting question because Afghanistan beat England in a very particular way. Uh, they get post a total that yeah. they, they squeeze the opposition in the second half of the game. They won the toss and had the opportunity to try and do something similar again on a pitch that is renowned for being one of the more spin-friendly, spinnier. spinnier pitches in India. But they didn't do that. And Simon Dool said on commentary that he spoke to Jonathan Trott through the game and sort of asked him why. Why do you do this? And Trott said, oh, this is, this is how you win at Chennai. And Dool said, no, 
that's that's how Chennai might win at yeah. Chennai, but how does your team win? And it's quite interesting because the two upsets that we've seen in the last few days, they have been teams with uh, strong spin attacks, squeezing sides in the second yeah. half of the game and due that can have a big impact on games. And, and the theory is that when the dew falls, it's harder for spinners to grip the ball and they become in a, less effective and the ball skids on more for the batters. That doesn't actually happen every time. And it feels it feels weird to me that captains are so almost, almost making a prediction on how much dew there's going to be at the start of the game when we have no idea how much dew yeah. there's going to be. I, I was really relieved, actually, because we, we got this question through and I went, oh, I don't know how to answer that. And I said that to you, I was like, I think you're going to have to handle that because I don't, I don't understand how Jew works. You're like, no, 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 that's the point. <laughs> like, we're kind of trying to predict a natural phenomenon kind of thing. Mm. I, I think that's giving too much credit to Jew being a natural <laughs> phenomenon. But it is, it, it's, it is a kind of classic case of, as you say there, Jonathan Trott trying to work, kind of, you're trying to reverse engineer a victory. And you think, okay, how is our team set up? We have these kind of really exciting uh, opening batters who are young. And then we have these three spinners who are going to kind of, take the game away at the end and if you put if you had a kind of an absolute median cricket pitch an environment you go right we're going to bat first we're going to have no scoreboard chasing pressure pressure so we're going to allow ourselves to put our foot down and score as many runs as possible and then the pitch is going to be a bit older and we're going to put our spinners on top of that and here Jonathan Trot has they've gone backwards from that and whether it's a kind of a team-wide buy-in with that strategy because as you said there doesn't there does seem to be a little bit of the public messaging that comes out of the camp isn't the same and I think that's why I think what to go back to why I was so frustrated at the beginning of kind of this episode is because it's a match where you can fall back and end up talking cliches about Afghanistan in terms of oh they're so oh, on their day they're a great team mm. but oh they have they have their bad days or whatever and that was what's happened today and we've seen the highs and we've seen the lows and Jonathan Trott has said in interviews very recently like the, what we really what the side really really needs is consistency Mm. And this was kind of the, the trough that followed the peak of the England win. Mm. Um, on one of my WhatsApp groups during the England-Afghanistan game, someone was wondering how good Afghanistan are. And I said that they're roughly the same level as Bangladesh, but way more likely to beat one of the big teams, but also more likely to have days like they ended up having yeah, today. I like and I think you, you talk about the consistency. I wonder, obviously, the fielding is something you can you can control almost. Teams can improve as fielding sides. But there is just a batting talent issue numbers three to six that's the weakest three to six in the competition they they are so reliant on Zadran and Romanula getting runs up top um which was sort of what made the England game so remarkable is that they, they had a significant batting co contribution from um Ikram in at six or seven mm. um I, I feel I feel like it's hard hard for them to be consistent when there is that sort of quite glaring weakness in the middle um, well, that, that is it for part one. In part two, we'll talk more about New Zealand and look ahead to tomorrow's India-Bangladesh game. Cam, New Zealand are four from four. In this World Cup format, it feels just quite important to just secure yourself from the upset. And they have a very stable side for that, I feel. Batting depth, three gun seamers. How impressed have you been with them so far? Because they are undefeated, but they also haven't necessarily faced the strongest opposition yeah. yet. They just play cricket, don't they? They're, they're kind of like the least volatile side ever. You kind of... Other teams have particular kind of methods and strategies and excitements. And yeah, New Zealand have like the Glenn Phillips phenomenon and kind of the middle orders, kind of like Superman in the field, wax it. But like Tom Nathan at five, like just kind of nudging, nerdly. It feels like they're playing kind of old fashioned cricket throughout. Like in terms of, as you say there, are they, I don't know if I think they're good. I, they were here in England. We were saying how bad England are at the moment, but England beat them 3-1 mm. less than a month ago. I guess and New Zealand shuffle their pack more than England did in that series. They they had players playing who aren't here at the World Cup. In the, in the, not even. But then in the you 15. can you can switch that to be like, oh maybe they, they if it's, say they've been losing a few games of like oh they're undercooked they missed the series before England kind of thing. Um, and so I guess that you can make a very good case that kind of New Zealand's tournament starts now as it were. They've got themselves in a position that they can win kind of one <laughs> of their next five and get themselves into a World Cup semi final. Like what a luxurious place to be. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I think they're that brilliant. I think they kind of have a team that works in terms of like a spin unit. They have Mitchell Santner, who whose stock just seems to keep growing and quite dramatically so. Mm. And then it's backed in with Glenn Phillips and Ravindra of the ball, who, who are neither, neither are spectacular spinners, but everything they do just is works. It's just fine. It just gets them to kind of the, the destination required. Mm. 
Yeah, I think the um, it's a re- it's a really good point in in that I think it's hard to work out exactly how how good they are at, at this point in time. I mean, I, I'm um, I'm an Arsenal fan, an Arsenal fan brought up in the uh, the, the late noughties, early early 2010s. Great time. And I know that to qualify to get to the top four, sometimes all you need to do is beat the bottom half teams, and, that, and that's often enough. You don't need to beat the big teams to finish fourth. And I feel like that is what New Zealand are actually really good at in this particular format. Which kind um, of, it feels like the inverse of what you're saying about Afghanistan and Bangladesh. You're saying, oh, they're similar. But Afghanistan are way more suited to beat the best teams, but have a kind of shocker against the worst teams. And New Zealand are set up to just their their range of potential is so small. Their worst day versus their best day isn't that different. So when they come up against a team they are better than, kind of eight times or nine times out of ten, they'll they'll win the fixture. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think that there are there are weaknesses there that have potentially not been exposed yet. So as you say, they've gone in with a very batting heavy side at the moment. Ravindra is effectively the fifth bowler, him and Phillips, yeah. uh, filling those overs. Ravindra's bowled a lot this tournament. He's, he's bowled uh, 32 overs, which is only five fewer than Santner. Both left-arm finger spinners, and and, and and Santner's going at fours, basically. Ravindra's going at going at sixes. He's been quite expensive at times. You think that the better teams will target him. England did, um, sort of successfully. And, you know, there were questions over Lockie Ferguson's form going into the tournament. Um, and I think he is also the type of bowler when he's not, at his very, very best, he's still going to be really, not quite devastating, but really difficult for the for the weaker sides, the weaker batting sides at least, to, to, to deal with. But against the top, top sides, when Ferguson's not 100% on it, that's a very different um, proposition. Um, I was thinking today that if, if the World Cup was a, a long run, uh, we're at that point <laughs> where you look at your GPS and think, blimey, we've, we've come quite far, but Bloody hell, we've long got a way long, to go. long way to go. <laughs> I've been trying um, to work out the table. Be like, what, is, what does it all mean? Yeah. What, what, when, when, do I, when can I look at this table and it means something to me? I don't, I don't know yet. I don't understand. Yeah, I, I, I spend at least 10 minutes every day working out, will it be five wins that's enough? Or is it well, six this, wins? Or is it, could four wins this be thing, enough? So Australia and Pakistan play, ne- play on Friday. Yeah. And however, like a matter of days ago, it was oh, Pakistan two from two in great shape. It's going to be brilliant. Mm. Australia naught from two. Car, they're terrible. They're out of it. And if Australia beat Pakistan on Friday, they're both two wins and two losses, and all of a sudden you're back to kind of, kind of ground zero. Basically, mm. it's like, well, what what, what happens next? Are <laughs> we just been drawing all these conclusions pointlessly for for, for the past ten days? Or yeah, it's been. Um, my moment of the game was that remarkable catch from Sandler. Oh one God. of those where even quite late, you're like, he's not getting anywhere near that, and then he did so well to to grasp it with his left hand, but then really well to, to not do as stark as he hit the ground and 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 and, and the gra- grass it. I feel like Mitch Shannon is kind of just a slightly less sexy Jadeja. Yeah. And like I kind of I've always I, and this is literally judging a book by its cover, but I've always kind of looked at Mitchell Santner and you go, okay, you're kind of this gawky, tall, white lad bowling some spinners, cool, whatever. Don't care. But mm. actually the way you hear his other other professionals talk about him, he's incredibly highly regarded. He whacks sixes he bowls very effective spin in the IPL and around the world, and he takes stunners. And actually, actually, it'd be quite fun being Mitchell Sandler. Is basically is, is the point of, is the place I'm ending up here. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting listening to Shane Watson on commentary, and someone who's faced probably every professional bowler in the world over the course of his career. Just talk how highly he spoke of Mitchell Sandler, and just saying like his variation of pace, the his ability to target both edges of your bat to like get one to sneak in past your the inside edge and kind of hammer your pad and also then to take all that pace off and rip one past your outside edge. And I was thinking it's very rare. I, of course, like it becomes easier for players to talk about others in such a kind of, what's the word, humble way where mm. you're saying, oh, they really showed me up for my weaknesses. But it was quite interesting to hear someone who was still so close to the mat- game and only was playing IPL and a matter of a couple of years ago being so kind of effusive in his praise of mm. Mitchell Santner. I think it's kind of making me realise how under how little I've rated him and how probably I've underrated him for years, basically. Mm. No, I think he's I think the Jadeja comparison works on a, on, a, on a few levels. I think he's uh he's very subtle in his variations, but they're quite effective. He's very and also his his height, he utilizes his height. I think he sometimes makes pitches look, particularly in India, look like they're more spin friendly than they mm. actually are because he, he he gets the ball to spit 
that's yeah. actually just because he's six foot two, six foot three or whatever. He had this amazing kind of 90 second, two minute period in the match where he, he took the catch over his shoulder, one handed, spectacular. And then he was straight back into the attack and kind of following over a matter of one or two balls later. And it was in the first half of his over, he got one to kind of dip and fizz from like middle mm. and leg to like beating the batter's outside edge. And you're like, you are good at cricket. Like, <laughs> well done. Like, he's kind of, as in terms of a full, complete package, he's got it. And yeah, so may- maybe um, earlier when I said, are New Zealand good? Maybe they are good. Or maybe Mitchell Santner's good. Maybe. Um, Neil asks, who are New Zealand dropping for Kane, Williamson and Tim Southey? Um, I, th- I feel like this answer it's kind of answered itself just through a matter of time i think um in kane williamson in particular it will be it will be a, like a will young ravindra shootout in terms of kane williamson came in for young but then young had the 250s and so actually no it's a case of he's having a good tournament now as well as ravindra who obviously got that 100 against england williamson won't be fit for a while so that will kind of sort itself out but that, i think you made the point um and it's a very good one in terms of Ravindra actually bowls a lot of overs now. So whether that will actually kind of tip the scales in his favour. In terms of Southie, do you know, what's your opinion? I don't think he's going to play. Okay. Uh, he didn't play in the business end of the 2019 World Cup. Um, but I remember him still being a very important squad member. People talk of him being very important. Uh, at the business end of the World Cup final, he was extremely vocal from the sidelines. So I think he's a really important member of that squad but with how good Henry is in ODIs with the new ball I don't think they'll want to disrupt that I think the time of recording is, is Henry the, the second leading wicket taker in the tournament I mm. think he, he's, he's really good at just hitting that that length the, the top of the stump length I'd yeah. say he, he offers very little wit at the start um, and I think why why would you change that I think um, if you play both of them you are you are using one of them in in a phase that doesn't suit them as much. I I don't think you could have both of them in the side using one as a first change bowler and obviously Bolt's going to open the bowling. So maybe Salvi plays the odd game if if New Zealand qualify early, which it looks like they might at the moment. But I don't think that if they had a semi-final tomorrow with all 15 members of the squad fit, I don't think Salvi plays that. Um, Tomorrow we've got the other unbeaten side in India facing Bangladesh. India looks so good so yeah. far but as we've seen upsets do happen I guess if it's on a turning pitch maybe Bangladesh have spinners who can exploit those conditions in, in a low scoring game it's I'm I'm just sad about how good India looks like it's just I was I said this uh on, on, a, on a rival podcast yesterday yeah. it's been um I, I'm getting kind of f1 this f1 season vibes about this where like well it could be a close battle exciting battle for second and then Verstappen and India are just flying off into the distance and just winning everything um, but it's still, I, hang on, if that does happen, that's still a pretty good World Cup because if this is just if the World Cup is one uh, Formula One race, right? Yeah, and the result doesn't happen until the very end. Like, however good India are, you still have the final. They still have. The they final. still have the knockouts. Sure, but I kind of in terms of oh, it would be so funny if they went ten from ten and then lost the final. It'd be like comical. But in terms of it, you just go through the lineup and it's the kind of Harlem Globetrotters type thing where you go, oh god. Oh, got this. I'll go, I'll go. No, I'll go the op- opposite way there. It's actually where the weaker or inverted commas weaker mm-hmm. players are actually performing unbelievably well. So Kuldeep Yadav is having this incredible, has started this tournament incredibly well. And you're like, but you're not meant to be the good one. <laughs> you're, it, J- Jadeja's meant to be the spin who's going to be like amazing. And and then, oh, they're, oh, they're blowing really well. They've had a couple of wins. Oh, Jasper Brummer is now back and he's being amazing as well. And there's just no weakness in that side. And it's quite... um. Yeah, it's very disappointing and uh, I, I can't see anything other than a very comfortable India victory. But tune in tomorrow. <laughs> tune in tomorrow. <laughs> very exciting tune in mixture. tomorrow. Uh, well, that is everything for today. Cheers, Cam. Thank we'll be you. back tomorrow after that India-Bangladesh game.